Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming to the Pro Social World Seminar Series. Um, so today our speaker is Dr. Richard Coates. Um, Richard is a pro-social trained facilitator and also a neuro clinical neuropsychologist. Do I have that right? Yeah. Um, so I think this will be um, extra special because not only does Richard have um, extensive research experience, he also has extensive experience in the field um, and bringing pro-social world into real contexts and real real world applications. So I, he'll be sharing a few of those with us all today. And I will pass it off to you, Richard. Mm. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to see uh, people here and uh, people from like different parts of my life and different groups. And um, yeah, you'll find out from my presentation that um, my real thrill in life, what really lights me up is connecting people and connecting ideas. So um, yeah, if I can do that doing a, doing a seminar as well. That is, um, yeah, that is me. Um, so, yeah, thank you for all being here. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, big hello to the people I can see with the videos on and a big hello to the people I can't see who uh, maybe can't have the videos on. And um, and a big hello to, uh, to those who can't make it and will be watching the recording as well. Uh, there are so many people there in all those different groups who... Um, yeah, just keep inspiring me and um yeah and just connecting those people just keeps on on adding more and more vitality to um to my life and other people's lives so i'm deeply grateful for for everyone here and everyone who's not here um, i'm just going to bring up um my slides and just to explain a little bit about what i'm going to talk about in this seminar Can I get some thumbs up if you can uh, see the slides okay? It yeah, brilliant. Cool. Um, yeah, so I wanted to do something really practical and concrete today about pro-social. Um, is, there, is there anyone here who, who isn't f familiar with pro-social in this context as a sort of as a process of working with groups and helping groups to work really well. Is there anyone who's not familiar with that? I can't see everyone on the side of my screen, but um, yeah. Okay, I'm not, see I'm not seeing any, any hands. Uh, Juliet, am I missing anyone? I think, yep, yeah, I think you're good. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so, I first did the uh, pro-social facilitator training back in 2019 uh, with Odette. Um, yeah, who's great to see here. Um, I also did it again, I think it was in 2022 because um, Paul said there was some new stuff with Miro and I'd never heard of Miro and I was curious and now I love using it as a whiteboard. So I've, I've done it a couple of times. And I remember in that first training session where you hear about it and it's amazing. And there were some people in my group who were doing amazing work already with like big authorities and big areas. And I afterwards, I just felt a little bit small, really. And how do I get started? Um, you yeah, know, what does this what does this look like? Um, I'm not in those big groups. And. And as I said in the sort of the, the abstract, I think it was Paul Atkins who said, wherever you can reach, it might not have been Paul, it might have been someone else, but it's logged in my brain as Paul. And, and that has been a really uh, helpful thing for me to remember. And so I've just looked around me and um, as Juliet said, um, I work as a, uh, as a neuropsychologist with adults who've had mainly a traumatic brain injury from a road traffic accident. I work with their teams who are working with them to help them with their rehabilitation, other professionals, uh, teams of support workers who are helping with their care needs and rehabilitation needs. And I'm also very passionate about helping our planets and where I live. So. Those are the places that I could reach to start off with. Um, so I'm going to show how I've thought about and applied pro-social in those two very different contexts. And that is the beauty of pro-social. 
that it, you know, they're general guiding principles. They're going to look different in every context. You want to make it sensitive to your particular context. So I hope to show that uh, in a couple of really concrete examples. I hope to leave plenty of time at the end for, for questions, comments, uh, how it relates to your own situation. So that's my intention for today. And um, I'm also going to do a very brief settling in. Um, as Juliet said, I'm a neuropsychologist, um, a clinical psychologist with that. Um, yeah, settling in for me is a really important practice for meetings. I'm going to say a little bit about my context, um, how I arrived here now, um, inspired by uh, Heidi Steltz's um, seminar last week uh, I really was really touched by that and there's lots of people were so um, yeah Heidi your presentation is inspiring me for this one um, <laughs> yeah thank you um, I'm just going to do a very brief recap of the pro-social core design principles and psychological flexibility uh, just so that you can see the links um, clearly. And as I said, two concrete examples of how I have put it into action. And of course, these have just been my ways of putting it into action. Um, yeah, find your own ways for your particular context and the groups you work with to put them into action. Yeah, so I'd just like you just to just to look at this image and just really just just take it in, have a real look around, be curious about all the different areas that you can see. And just notice what shows up in you, any thoughts, feelings that show up. And what do you notice in your body as you're looking at this image, what sensations do you notice? And to see if you can really connect with the beauty of this image. And if you can just connect with your own reasons for being here now, what, yeah, what made you turn up here at this time on a Friday to this talk? Why are you here for this talk? And why are you here in life? What is, what is your purpose? And just a little bit about my context, how the, the Richard here now is partly the Richard here now. Obviously, there's so much more context than this. Uh, and I guess I was thinking back to my very first sort of the stories people tell about you. And my mum always says when I was when I was little and I was, you know, just starting to talk, we were away on holiday and we went past someone and they said hello and I didn't say hello back. And then my mum told me that I should always say hello to everyone. And that's kind of been my, uh, my way for life. Um, yeah, I always, uh, you know, at least attempt to say hello to people. Um, yeah, I like people and um, I like speaking with random people throughout my day, whether it's at the train station or anywhere else. My my primary school, my early years was a was a bit unusual for me. The very first school I went to up until the age of eight um, 
most boys didn't stay until like the last year so I was one of three boys and uh, that was a really tough last year where um yeah more dominant boy would find it a fun game to run off with the other boy every break time and so I would spend my break times wandering around just trying to to find them and um that that really hurts um when you're really alone um that's really really painful and and equally I kind of see it now as maybe that has really helped me find people um yeah I've recognized that I'm, I'm good at finding people there's a connection that I want to make um I find a way to uh yeah connect with them somehow and also failure has been really important in my life. Um, I wanted to go to Nottingham University to study psychology. I didn't get the grades that I needed. And um, I ended up staying behind for an, another year and repeating two of my A-levels. And then Nottingham University still didn't want me. Um, and so I ended up going to, to Sheffield University. Um, that, that year out, I started working with people with brain injuries. I became fascinated in that. And that's led me to this job now. And also, um, if I'd gone to Nottingham University, I wouldn't have met my wife. I wouldn't have my children that I have now. And just how important failure is uh, in our journey in life as well. And my first job, uh, when I qualified, I worked in London, in Putney, at the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability, which was an amazing place. It used to be known as the Home for Incurables, which is a really awful name for people. Um, you know, people who were really struggling, and then it then became a specialist brain injury hospital, where people with very severe brain injuries would be so there was a lot of complexity to work with, um, people with very poor insights, people who didn't want to work with you. Um, yes, yeah, so it was a really challenging, complex place to work, having just qualified. And it was a brilliant and amazing, practical, creative place. Um, people may think of a neuropsychologist as someone who sits in the office and does tests with people. This wasn't at all the case there. You got stuck in, uh, you got in sessions with other professionals, working with physios, occupational therapists. You were going all around like London, traveling on buses, um, working jointly, collaborating with people, being creative. And there's a particular speech and language therapist, Emma Gale, who was brilliant with project-based rehab, coming up with a project to bring people together so that there was, a, there was meaning and purpose in what they were doing rather than an abstract set of exercises you were giving someone to do to help with their rehab. And then I'm, I'm so grateful for the River Thames in lots of ways. I, yeah, I live on the River Thames and one Christmas with our neuropsychology department in the NHS after I'd left that job in London. Uh, there was another um, psychologist who started telling me about ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. I'd never heard of it at this point. And he said, you've got to check this out. You've got to check this guy, Russ Harris out. And in the NHS, there was very little funding and so eight years passed and I did nothing about it. But then when I left the NHS and started working independently, I had some money for training. I remembered this information from eight years ago. I did some of Russ's online training and I just connected to it immediately. It made so much sense to my work with people with brain injuries. It was all about connecting with what mattered to people it was managing all the, diff the difficult thoughts and feelings and it, parts of life that get in the way of that. And also Russ as a trainer, he is fun, he is creative. And so that really comes across and just the importance of making it fun with what you're doing with people to get people to engage with what you're doing. 
And through that process, I've learned what matters to me as a person to get in touch with my values. And for me, some of the most important ones for me are connection, connecting people, connecting ideas, learning and creativity. And these, since I discovered these in about uh, 2000 and maybe 2016, I think. These have just been such a powerful thing. Heidi's seminar last week about transformation. This was, was transformational for me. Um, it's led me from just going in and doing a job and going home to just following my heart wherever that takes me and uh, doing more and more and connecting with more people. So this was a pivotal moment for me. And all of my clients and the people I've worked with, um, as I said, um, it's really hard working with people with severe brain injuries. Um, yeah, people just don't want to engage with you. Um, yeah, don't know who you are, um, wary of psychologists. Um, yeah, so it, it takes a lot to uh, build up trust with people and, uh, and really get to know them for who they are and what matters to them. And that has just really stood me in good stead. And I'm so grateful for the uh, the ACBS community, the, the family that ACT sits under, um, Association for Contextual Behavioural Science. Again, just um, feeling like I belonged, um, not feeling like that little boy sort of wandering around trying to find the other boys, but finding that I, I belonged in a, in a community of other people uh, who are really passionate about yeah, helping other people um, and going to world conferences particularly Dublin for me in 2019 was again just transformational that me saying hello to everyone and you know being open I started talking to a guy at the bus stop when we were waiting to go down to the the poster presentation and that guy turned out to be Stu Liebman he got out his um, his little presentation about pro-social, which I'd never heard of before, and started telling me about pro-social on the bus. And uh, yeah, and again, that's been transformational. And also um, Robin Walzer and Martin Wilkes, who did a, a workshop at the very end of the conference about uh, climate change and um, ACT helping with us taking action. And my committed actions from that workshop were to sign up to the pro-social facilitator training, uh, which I did in 2019. And then there's a pro-social community, amazing, amazing people. There's a community where I live, which I've got to know through yeah, doing pro-social work really to connect with people. And then more moving on a regenerative path now again through connecting with people in pro-social uh, he told me about regenesis and the amazing training they do and then finding the design school for regenerating earth with joe brewer and penny hypo and benji ross and uh, heidi being a member of uh, the design school and, and others and yeah so so many people but that's just a, a snapshot and hopefully you get a get a sense of, of who I am as a person from that and, and what matters to me. And that is, I remember do, doing the, um, the six month re Regenesis training and we finished with a three day intensive. And again, that was a transformational moment where you spend a lot of time asking yourself questions. And um, yeah, what's what's your essence? What's your role in life? And um, for me, it's just become very clear. Uh, it's um, it's as a as a connector. Um, that is what gives me energy. Um, yeah, that is um, yeah, that's what I feel my 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 skills are. Uh, my my gift to to people around, and um, and I meet you know so many other people as well who really share that purpose um, 
and yeah that that gives me the energy to keep going with all of the difficult stuff and that's what brings me lots of energy just as a a brief um, recap of of pro social um, in this work and these presentations I'm thinking, of course, of the core design principles, um, shared identity and purpose, really defining the group, equal distribution of costs and benefits, fair and inclusive decision-making, monitoring agreed behaviors, graduated responding to helpful and unhelpful behavior, fast and fair conflict resolution, authority to self-govern, and collaborative relationships. And so for, for me, these, these principles alone, I kind of hold in my head and I just, yeah, think about it in so many different contexts now, when people say they don't belong in situations and you can see that they don't have that shared identity and purpose. Um, I was listening to one client saying about how Growing up, they had an early brain injury and their parents were, were trying to force them to meet with other people with childhood brain injuries because they grouped them artificially as, you know, one child with a brain injury goes with another child with a brain injury. And they said they, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to play with the children who liked Pokemon. And so that was their sh shared identity and purpose. And it just, yeah, it just made sense why it wasn't working. And so, yeah, these, these are kind of yeah, guiding, guiding principles that I keep in my mind in lots of different situations. And I also think about you know, David's multi-level selection um, as this comes into this and thinking about which which level are we operating on? And as you know, David will say that you know, things can be great for, for you on your level, but they can be terrible for your family. And what's good for your family can be terrible for your community. And what's good for your community can be terrible for the region that you live in. And what's good for the region you live in can be terrible for the planet. So it's, yeah, David's thinking with this and thinking more in systems with Regenesis as well. That's really helped me to, you know, expand my thinking, think more broadly. Uh, and of course, everything is, everything is nested. And then the third piece of pro-social, which, yeah, it, it fitted with, my experience of ACT before and how powerful that is, is that psychological flexibility piece. And um, that, that inner skill, that inner work is, is so often missing. You can really see it in groups where people just don't have those, those skills and the, the real impact it has on groups. So um, I can really see how important this is to the work as well. Um, and as I said, you know, with, with me finding ACT and how that has, you know, brought me to this place, following my value is what really mattered to me. And um, being able to notice, you know, all the stuff my mind was saying, this is never going to work. Um, people are going to think you're mad, you're crazy. Um, yeah, this is, this is too hard. What's the point? Um, yeah, all of those skills have been so important uh, to me and the work that I do. And so now on to thinking about the two examples. Um, the first one is inspire others. Um, this is just a snapshot of the amazing people within this, this project. And it is all about the people um, in the group. Um, none of this would be possible without each and every person. And on the left, you can see us when we met for our, um, it was our one year, one year anniversary that got a bit delayed. 
and uh, you'll see the rest of the time how we were mainly meeting on on zoom this is a mixture of professionals and clients with different brain injuries we were quite sort of spread out across the region um, so we mostly met on zoom but we also did get to meet in person and share food together which was amazing and uh, you can also see our mugs uh, which we got especially done for our anniversary, which I've got in honor of Inspire Others here today as well. So thinking about Inspire Others, I was really stuck working with a client and I've come now to, to find stuckness really a wonderful thing because I've come to learn now that when I'm stuck, when there's something pushing against me, there's an opposing force, that's when something new emerges, some creativity emerges. And for me, oh, I will go back a second, with, with this client, they had a very severe brain injury. I've been working with them for quite a while with the team. They couldn't go back to, to work they were doing beforehand. We tried engaging them in voluntary work and they said voluntary work was a crappy job. Why did they want to do that? We couldn't find any way to really engage them. And equally, they were doing so much amazing stuff. Um, they were told they would never um, run again. They would never swim again. Um, they'd just done uh, a sport relief mile for charity where they ran some of it and they walked some of it. Um, this year, they've just done a, a triathlon, um, the Superheroes Triathlon. Um, so, you know, doing swimming, adapted cycling and finishing with a run. They were just doing so much amazing stuff. And so we were, we were really stuck. And I was dreaming one night and it was just the early hours of the morning in that REM sleep where all of a sudden it all just came together. Create a website called Inspire Others. Tell inspiring stories of people with neurological conditions so that hopefully it inspires other people. I woke up in the morning. I, I looked and see if anyone else had got this web, web name. I registered the domain name inspireothers.org.uk and then I started reaching out seeing who would want to join me and this was the 10th of June 2020 and I just wrote this very simple email to colleagues who I worked with some who I worked with with this client um, and some who I worked with in other teams and others who I thought might be vaguely interested and uh, and then it went and then you know, i had all that mind stuff going on yeah again people are going to think you're crazy no one's going to want to get involved in this and amazingly some people did respond um i'm just trying to see if jude because i can only see a few people yeah i can see jude's picture is here her video isn't on but jude Berowondo, uh who was in maidenhead in the uk and has now moved to california did respond. Uh, Jude is a speech and language therapist who I was working with with this client and someone who is amazingly creative and I love working with. And also a few other people did. And we had a, a Zoom together. There were five of us who were interested and responded. And for, for this project, I explicitly introduced people to ProSocial. Um, they were familiar with working with me and I had explained you know, other things about ACTS and the way I worked. So it, it seemed appropriate in this context to be explicit with ProSocial right from the start. And the very first time we met, we introduced the ACT matrix to people. Um, if anyone isn't familiar with the ACT matrix, it is about some simple lines and directions. So moving towards what matters to you, 
moving away from the difficult stuff or the painful stuff or being hooked and pulled away from stuff. And there's the inner dimension, what goes on inside us, our thoughts, our feelings, what matters to us, and the outer dimension, what you could be seen doing in the world. And in the center, there is usually noticing for an individual. And if you're doing it as a group, it's helpful to have it as us noticing. And so for us, we just spent time going around each person, connecting with what really mattered to us, this, this simple idea, this vision that I'd shared. And there was lots that came out of it that people you know, wanted something different to offer their clients they were working with. People aware that it was the process that was going to be really important to this. A sense of community and support. Being able to share a resource with other clients that their clients would say, yes, that's really describing what I'm experiencing. People not feeling alone in their experiences. And also as a team, there was a sense that we would develop ourselves through this process. We would uncover stuff, skills we didn't have or we didn't, we didn't know we had through this process as well. And we, you know, we spent time thinking about the difficult stuff that was going to show up, the usual, not having enough time. Will we get anywhere with this? Anxiety, hoping it doesn't get bigger than we can handle. And then, yeah, what would happen if we were moving away and caught up in this stuff? You know, doing other things, procrastinating, never getting around to getting it started, not approaching people to take part. And then we thought about what would those small steps be towards what really mattered to us. And none of us had ever created a website before. None of us had ever done anything like this before. So it was really just thinking about those tiny steps. And then this became like our sort of, you know, our actions, our minutes really um, for the session where we would do this, look at the matrix, update the actions each time. And step by step, things started to build up. We got some solicitors who again, really loved the story were willing to pay sponsorship to help with paying a web designer to build the website because we didn't have those skills. We contacted different clients we were working with. Um, they loved the idea. They were willing to share their stories to help other people. There were new clients we'd started working with that gave something to start working with them on. So, so much kept adding and adding to this. And this was the um, the vision that um, yeah that we came up with. If your screen is anything like mine, you may have to make people a bit smaller. I don't know whether anyone can see the stuff on the right hand side, but. Yeah, but it was, yeah, it was innovative, inspiring others to move towards what mattered to them, offering hope and a breath of fresh air and creating a sense of community, encouragement and support. And this was the first story I started writing uh, with Chris. Um, I'd never written a blog with someone. At this stage, we were in COVID and everything was virtual. So I was doing this with screen sharing. Um, Chris has very significant memory difficulties. And so I would, I explained the initial idea. He loved it. Then we meet again and I could make the mistake of not explaining things again. And he'd be like, why are we doing this? And I soon learned I needed to explain things again and again. And then he was in, he, he loved it. And, um, and this, this was a person who didn't want to get involved with any voluntary work. It was a crappy job. And he went from that position to actually being really assertive about what he wanted in his story. 
and was really, really happy with the end result, wanted to share it as far and wide as he could. And this is Chris very shortly after, after his coma. And for him, this is, this is him, his essence. He loves golf. This was the first thing he did with people standing up to help him. And then this led to other creative ideas with people we were working with. There was someone we were working with who was a teacher who was, um, was teaching students about um, graphic art, uh, very creative. Um, I, can't, I can't think of the right term to describe her work at the moment, but yeah, someone who was very creative, design teaching with her students. She couldn't go back to work again. And we just had the idea, can we involve her on a project to design the logo for this website? And just told her this and then went back a week later and she'd come up with this pencil sketch um, with the person inside and even, you know, even got inspire others in this with the head uh, being the O and the I being inspire. Uh, they'd thought a lot about this logo. We got the graphic designer involved. They come up with these options. And then as a group, we had a you know, fair and inclusive decision-making. We voted on this and people chose the logo to go with, which was number three. And then this is, yeah, the website coming together. Um, and then we got to a point where we got nine people sharing their stories, all people with different neurological conditions. I looked at the website today, and uh, if you click on it and people's stories, there is unfortunately a blocker that's appeared with YouTube videos. Um, so if you look on our YouTube channel, you will see the actual videos, but our web designer is trying to sort out this blocker that's just appeared. So that's an ongoing relationship with the web designer that we need because we can't do that stuff. And then for me, it's that connecting within this. You've got those into people who've started, what are the opportunities to connect those people? And so one of the first connections was linking Chris to uh, Chuck. And uh, Chuck is uh, an amazing breathwork instructor in California, um, who I reached out to to help my own breathwork practice. It just happened he had a brain injury. I didn't know that. Um, we've had an ongoing connection now for years. Chuck was inspired by Chris's story. Chuck wanted to see if he can help. He taught Chris how to do breath work via Zoom from California. And now Chris listens to Chuck's free breath work um, workshops he does every day and teaches other people. Um, and Chuck has gone on to help other people within the group as well. So everyone has been weaving together. And then just thinking back to those core design principles, how has this looked in practice? CDP1, we've had our vision, we've used the matrix. Equal distribution of costs and benefits. It's that more informal way of just checking in with people. You know, are you okay? You seem like you've got, to, you know, you're doing a lot. Can I help with this? Equally, if one, you know, if I'm feeling I'm doing a bit too much, you know, saying, would someone else be willing to do this, sharing that load? We make decisions using the platform Slack. Um, we also make decisions when we meet as a whole group online. We we monitor whether we whether we've done things or not using Trello. Uh, this is a way that works for us. And again, Trello came from Robin Walzer suggesting that as a way to work. So it's learning from other people. And of course, there's all of that, you know, thanking people. Um, yeah, really being explicit when people are doing great stuff and in messages, using all the emojis and everything as well. We've had very little conflict. Um, we do have authority to uh, to do our own stuff, to make our own decisions. The sponsors have given us money, but we can just do what we like with it. 
And um, yeah, these are the sponsors who we have this ongoing collaborative relationship with and so many other groups. So that is, that is Inspire Others. I've spent um, a bit more time talking about it than I intended to, but there is so much to share and so much more that I could say. I wanna move on to thinking about pro-social in a different context now, which is with where I live and Pearly Sustainability Group. And again, it's the people that count. This is a group and none of us could do this alone. So I live here. And as we zoom in, you start to see the defining feature of the landscape here, the River Thames, which bends round and round on its way to London. Oxford is upstream here. And this is the kind of the blurry boundary of Purley on Thames here. And if you zoom in again, here's the River Thames and it's this particular bend here, which is where Purley is. And there's a big floodplain meadow here, Blount's Meadow. There's a big housing area down here in the lower part of Purley down the hill. Then you've got the main road and the main train line between London, Paddington and Bristol passing through here, separating this a bit. And then you've got the rest of Purley sort of up here. Some people call this Upper Purley and this Lower Purley. And I live in, in Upper Purley here. And for me, what got me wanting to do something acting was uh, David Attenborough, brilliant naturalist, if anyone doesn't know him, particularly sharing about all the plastic pollution in the oceans. That was the first thing that really sort of drew my attention to this and feeling angry and wanting to do something. And then there were, there were other groups already doing stuff here to, to help the planet. So there was some fertile soil to really start something here. Um, there was a, a regional group called West Bark's Climate Action Network. Um, so it was great to know other people cared in the area. There was a, a local group uh, just further upstream from me, the next village up, um, who were running Pangbourne and Whitchurch Sustainability Group. And they've been doing this for about 10 years, so like lots of experience. My wife and I started going to their meetings and uh, they were doing great work. They also offered to include Pearly in their group. So it would have been another P, it would have been Pearly, Pangborn and Whitchurch Sustainability Group, which just sounded a bit of a mouthful. And I knew from, you know, it had to be our place. We needed something for Pearly to engage people. And there was also the wonderful Mad Duck Cafe, which had been set up by two wonderful people, Mandy and Donna who had lived in the village for a long period of time and wanted to create that sense of village that they remembered when people looked out for themselves, you know, not out for themselves, out for each other. Um, yeah, they wanted to, to really change things, care for the community. They weren't bothered about making lots of money. It was doing something to bring back that sense of a village for them. And so with with acts and um yeah feeling that it's it's okay to try and it's okay to fail you just need to experiment see what works um i just said to my wife why don't we just try setting up our own group and i wrote this this message on a local facebook group um mandy and, Don and donna down at the mad duck cafe had agreed to stay open late for us on a Friday night so we could meet there. And my wife and I walked down there and we just didn't know what would happen. Would we be the only ones in there? And luckily people turned up. Um, yeah, there were there were eight of us to start off with and there were people who were all used to, to volunteering. Um, you know, people had been school governors on the Parent Teacher Association, volunteering with different groups and these people with lots of pro-socialing 
turned up, which was amazing. And my wife is a really strong introvert. Uh, she finds you know, meetings with other people really uncomfortable, stressful, draining. Um, so she wanted me to do the talking. I'm, you know, I'm used to facilitating groups and uh, I'm quite happy to do that. Uh, so I just started to share the vision with people. And then just try to find out from everyone going around what, what mattered to them, why were they here? And people shared their individual interests. A lot of people were passionate about you know, wildlife and gardening. That was probably the biggest thing. Some people were interested in energy. Some people interested in repairing stuff. And then it became, became sort of seeing these groups self-organizing, coming into different separate groups. Um, and then we had WhatsApp groups for all those different potential groups that started. Um, someone, we had our youngest member there um, who was you know, really good with technology. She offered to set up the Facebook group that got things started as well. And so we were, we were moving, we were, we were self-organizing. And then my, my wife is really good at writing and would, you know, write on the Facebook group then, just highlighting to people, being transparent with what was going on and um, yeah, finding ways again for people to connect with what mattered to them. So we had initial ideas about starting a repair cafe, food swapping, a community garden or orchard. You know, we were borrowing ideas off you know, other people, what was going around, what was popular, and also what were people really energized by. And then COVID hit. We'd only been going for two weeks. Um, so yeah, that was really, yeah, really hard initially. Luckily with, with work, I, I had to switch to, to Zoom for my clients. So we were able to switch over to, to Zoom meetings quite easily, keep meeting. We were meeting every two weeks at this point. So fairly regular, which was important. And then it, as restrictions were starting to be lifted, it was like, what could we do? There was still, so this, this isn't during COVID times because we're all closer together, but the first thing we did was a litter pit because that was something we could do outside with social distancing. And that started to engage people. People would come along in the community. So again, it was where we could reach. And then we've done regular ones ever since. And then the, there was the repair cafe. That was a really burning and passionate idea by, by one person, Roz. And she was willing to take the lead on this. My wife helped set up uh, registering with the International Repair Cafe. And this, when we started it, you could just see the energy. And I've kind of you know, learned to kind of go with the energy with community events. Um, you'd see people bringing in their item they thought was broken. And then they're coming out with a big smile on their face. Um, yeah, one of the amazing things I remember was someone had a, a heated uh, clothes era that had been broken for 10 years because there was a bit of plastic that was broken, couldn't get it anywhere. Uh, Robin, who's an amazing um, yeah, repairer, he had a 3D printer. So he printed this exact piece that was needed and it was working again after 10 years. Um, yeah, and it, it's just brought a real sense of purpose to people, um, people who've got really good practical skills, a lot who are retired, and they've been able to you know, put those skills back into action again. And this is uh, Mandy and this is Donna, who run the Mad Duck, and they absolutely love it. They were the only place that were willing to have us initially because people were worried we were going to damage their floors with all this repairing they were like yeah come on come on down and uh, and now they say it's their favorite day of the year again it's a regular interval it's the second saturday of the month three to five p.m so that you know predictability has been really important and we've had someone who was visiting from Australia who had a hole in their trousers and came along to get the hole repaired. All kinds of amazing stuff. And there's just a real buzz. Uh, people absolutely love it. 
And then we were trying to think, you know, what can we do with like land? Um, you know, someone owns all of the land. It's so hard to do anything. And then someone said, well, why don't we just put our name down on the allotments? And, uh, and again, this is doing something different. Uh, so most people here would just have their own allotments and grow their own stuff. But we had the idea about doing it as a community allotment that we would be pro-social and we would work together um, to produce organic produce that could be shared locally and people would get real benefit out of coming along and us helping doing stuff together. And you can see on the left hand side, we've got two allotments now. This was the second one that we took on. It was covered in carpet, plastic sheeting, so much plastic through the soil. It took us ages to get out, get it all out. And now this is what it was looking, you know, at the height of this season. Uh, we were trying the three sisters approach with the corn and the, the squash. Uh, something kept eating all of our corn, um, so we didn't get any, but we got so much squash and beans out there as well. And uh, the people who come along just absolutely love it. It keeps drawing in new people. Um, I had someone uh, say about, you know, the power of strange attractors, something that draws people in. And this is something that really does draw people in. And then with all the produce from the community meal, um, Juliet here saw there was a, a Soil Association grant that they would give some money towards an allotment if you put on a community meal. And um, Julia is brilliant at feeding people. Um, she gathered lots of produce all throughout the season. Her friend down the road has a massive chest freezer. So she got her friend to put all of this stuff in the chest freezer. So there was asparagus and peas and things early on. And these will turn into the soups and then later things into curries. And we had our first meal down at the allotments. There was a, a space right by the entrance. Um, and we had about 50, 60 people turn up. It was free, anyone could come along. And I remember there was one person sitting here who said, I've sat in this spot for 20 years and thought this would be a wonderful place to have a gathering. And now it's happening. And it was absolutely amazing. And there were people who'd lived in the village for 30 years, didn't know anyone, anyone apart from their neighbours. They came along, started to get to know people. And it was a really beautiful thing. And also new members. So Alison here, this was the first time she turned up. She'd heard about it, thought it was wonderful. And now she's a regular member on our committee. She comes to all our meetings. Um, and this is, yeah, this is Roz who, yeah, really took the lead for the Repair Cafe. And then other natural things happened as well with the cost of living going up, people having similar ideas at the same time. The Mad Duck wanted to do something to help people. We wanted to do something to help people. Um, community fridges were popular. Um, food banks. We wanted to do something slightly different, um, something that was unique to us. And Mandy, who is very creative, very artistic, came up with the Pearly Pantry. And this is just in the entry to the, the to the cafe where anyone can bring stuff, put it in, and anyone can take it out. It's supposed to be sort of easy. Um, and it also links with the allotments as well. So this is produce that we, you know, just got out of the allotment. It's fresh local produce for just anyone to help themselves to. And then last year, uh, other people, uh, noticed um, the work that we were doing and um, we've we formed an ongoing relationship with lots of different groups and uh, one group has been the local parish council and so one of the local parish councillors nominated us uh, for this award and we were really grateful to receive it um, only a few people of us were allowed to go along to the awards ceremony um, so, yeah, that's everyone else here who was a part of this and so much more. And then David visited. Uh, this was in February 
Um, David isn't in the photo because he's taking the photo. Um, and with, with Pearly Sustainability Group, it was different to inspire others. I had the framework of pro-social in my mind and people within Pearly Sustainability Group were, were naturally very good at pro-social behavior. They had a lot of experience. So it was only when David came that it actually made pro-social more explicit. David went through the principles with people. Um, and that was that was the very first time. And I was very nervous about this. And uh, you know, my mind was saying, you no, know, people are gonna think you've been, you know, manipulating things, uh, all of this stuff. Um but if you know, it felt important to, to share it as well and see how people responded to it. Um, and one person responded that it was really interested, really interesting what David said, but it, it went over their heads a bit. Um, so I knew I had to adapt that a bit. And so I did a, a video um, explaining how pro-social looked in our group with all the, the different aspects. And um and also in this group, I invited the um, the sustainability group up the road who'd originally inspired us, Pangborn and Whitchurch Sustainability. So there was some pro-social with other groups within this lunch that we had, and also a member of the parish council as well. And it was that simple thing of, of having lunch together, uh, such an important thing. Um, and yeah, just a great, great way to spend some time with David while he was over. And then I, I did a, a questionnaire, getting our group to think about how we were doing against the CDPs, how they now knew of them. So people filled that in. And uh, one of the things people filled in was that they didn't always think we had a clear idea of, of our shared identity and purpose. Um, so we did spend a session as a group. I was using Miro because I really like that and the sticky notes. And uh, this is what people came up with. Um, so for them, it was, you know, and for us, doing something about the environment, the green agenda, doing something locally, meeting other people who care, and developing caring where we live. So this was, this was really powerful just to really make this part explicit. And then when we had our annual meeting, this was one of the photos we had displayed up on the wall. This was what mattered to us as a group. And then for me, there's other stuff that I think about that, you know, other people do and, you know, make connections, talking with people. Um, I've, yeah, I like sort of mapping and thinking about things and thinking about all the, the, the relationships that are happening. So there's Pearly Sustainability Group here. There's us connected with the Mad Duck. There's the river. And then there's all of the other groups where, you know, we've got connections with now. And those connections are working really well and more and more developing each time. So for example, the local scout group has asked our repair cafe team if they can go in and do a, a session with them, teaching younger people how to repair things, which I love. It's that intergenerational, that sharing of knowledge and experience. And, and, uh, and hopefully it worked the other way around. You know, maybe the scouts can, uh, can teach the repair cafe crew something as well. Um, so that is brilliant. That is that is happening. The scout leader just approached Roz, who leads the repair cafe, to ask that. And and so many more connections happening. Um, I, we got invited to go in to talk at the local primary school as well. So um, I did a talk with a couple of other people to 95 children. Um, the children have been to the local church. Um, the children have been doing their eco awards. And uh, when they went to the churchyard, they're saying, well, you're not doing very much to help nature here. Where are your bird boxes? Uh, you know, where are your bug hotels? All of those kind of things. And um, the school didn't have anyone who could make those things. Whereas at one of our community meals, the last one we had this year, I was saying, we've got someone who's really good and all of that practical stuff and able to connect them. He came along to the talk. He'd made a hedgehog house and a bird box for blue tits that he was able to bring into the school, talk to the children about that. 
and again just making making that connection and the children are thrilled to have a hedgehog house so that hopefully that is something that you know that lights them up that's the energy in the children to to try and yeah bring back more hedgehogs in Pearly. And then I've kind of expanded out of my thinking and, you know, thinking there's my community and how does that link, you know, with the landscape, um, using the river to guide me and thinking, yeah, who is there doing the great work? There are so many people out there doing amazing work and I've come to, to learn through experience and from others that, that often you just don't know who those people are and those people don't know each other. So for me, it's been yeah finding those people outside. So there's a lot of connections going on in here, but over the other side of the river, there's a brilliant uh, regenerative estate um, who I didn't, I didn't know people there. It's called the Hardwick Estate. Uh, some people say, it's the uh, the inspiration for um, for Mr. Toad in the Wind of the Willows book, if anyone knows that. Um, but they do you know, amazing um, yeah, organic farming. Um, there's a there's an outdoor school um, with children you know, who are struggling uh, in uh, traditional classrooms where it is very much nature based nature connection. Um, and so um, last week on Wednesday. I, uh, I went and met the person who runs this, um, had a walk around. I'm going to do some, some volunteering there, maybe help with some groups. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's finding, finding these, these people, these connections that I didn't know, and also going downstream as well, an amazing group called Nature Nurture who are doing lots of nature connection with children. So for me, I see that as, as CDP8, having those pro-social relations with, with other groups. And again, that's what energizes me, that, that connecting with those different groups. And then sort of most recently in our transition, um, so not our transition, in our evolution, um, we've created a website. Um, yeah, someone called Wendy um, has, has done this. Uh, they hadn't done, done this before. This was new for them. They, uh, they got help from... Uh, uh, from their husband who, who does do this kind of stuff and um yeah and it's just been a, a brilliant addition again making things transparent to people so they can see what we're doing um and yeah finding people you know ways to see see yeah, see what we're doing find out what really connects with them and get involved with what, what connects to them and so in this context, what do our CDPs look like? We've we've got our, our vision, which is on uh, our website. We've got the, um, the what matters to us session that we did that really clarified that. Again, making making what we're doing equal um, in terms of costs and benefits. It's been more of those informal things, um, just checking in with people, um, decision making. We started off with, with two weekly meetings, then I went to three weekly, and now that is monthly. That feels like a, a manageable schedule to people. We also have um, weekly opportunities to go down at the community allotments and help there. So on a Sunday morning at 9.30, people have somewhere to go on a regular basis. There's the repair cafes that happen as well. Um, we also use WhatsApp for lots of quicker decisions. Uh, we make decisions by by consent you know if everyone agrees okay we go forwards if someone disagrees then we we change things around and we've also had open meetings as well inviting you know people in uh from the from the public as well um to lots of different ways we really try and um, yeah, make it fair and inclusive in terms of uh, monitoring what we're doing um we started off taking physical meet, uh, minutes. My wife was was doing that. That became too much to her. And, uh, and actually, all of this on top of her work became too much. So she decided to leave. It, was, it wasn't something that she could continue with anymore. So um, that was hard. We had to adapt. I'd seen other people recording meetings and then sharing recordings. So we used that for a while. 
And then with those pro-social relations with the repair cafe, there was someone who's done a lot of minute taking there and they volunteered to actually come along and take the minutes for us, which is you know, the least popular job ever. So um, that was amazing that they could see they could really add value to this. And again, lots of, you know, lots of positive reinforcement for the things we're doing well. We've had very little conflict. If there has been conflict, maybe it's been conflict with sort of outside groups, um, you know, that we haven't, uh, we haven't strimmed all our paths around the allotment because we're, we're trying to encourage nature and biodiversity and the, and the rules of the allotment are you're supposed to get your strimmer out and clear everything away. So we've, you know, we've had to manage those things sensitively. Um, and we've also had to make some tough decisions. That's core design principle seven, where it's that ability to, yeah, make those decisions ourselves. We were looking at one site for a community orchard with a landowner. And it was turning out in the end that it was going to look more like how the landowner wanted it to look like that we were losing our autonomy. So we we had a, a Zoom meeting all together. We went round and we shared our perspective on it. I, I was thinking, yeah, let's go ahead with it anyway. And we listened to everyone. And actually the wisdom of the group was, yeah, this isn't going to work. And uh, and I saw that collective wisdom and um, yeah, we decided to to walk away from that. And that was really hard because there were a lot of people interested in the orchards. But then those relationships then turned out something else where the parish council said, we've, we've got this park, we're changing things. Would you like to have the orchard here? And then lastly, that's, yeah, that's CDP8. It's those ongoing relations with other people, which have just been, yeah, so, so key and um, really do feel as though we know people, we've we've connected people and it's been adding to um, the brilliant work that other people are doing and we're just doing so much more together um, so that is that is what we've been doing and uh, and just thank you to to everyone to all of the people who've made this happen and just to say there's, there's so much more happening <laughs> once you start pro socialing you just can't stop and uh, so uh, this is a this is another group of um, neuro rehab professionals that I'm involved in who want to raise awareness about vestibular difficulties. So when your balance system is is um, is damaged, you know, from a head injury or something, it affects everything. Um, your balance system develops from eight weeks in the womb. It's the first thing that develops, and then everything else becomes connected to it. So. If your balance system is damaged, you can't concentrate on things, you can't see things, you don't know where you are in space, and it is a really, yeah, really hard thing to live with. So this was using an explicit pro-social process with people, which has led to different groups, and, you know, this was new to the people in this group. That's really, really helped, really given lots of energy, um, you know, leading to some really cool stuff. And then for me, it's bringing the, the neuro rehab world and you know the planet nature connection together. And um, yeah, I was feeling really low in my work, unsatisfied with my work, just stuck inside. Uh, after COVID and everyone going back to normal, I didn't want to go back to normal and just doing the same stuff of like conferences indoors I wanted to go outdoors. I wanted to do more nature-based work. And so this was something that um, came up with when I was doing some stretching after after some uh, some exercise. And then again, just reached out to people who might be interested. And we've got a little group of uh, six of us who are putting this on. And this is connecting with other people locally who've seen advertising for this. Um, I want to get involved as well. So, yeah, so much. These are um, oh, these are my contact details, um, and just some some more links to websites, um, and just a 
a shout out uh, to a new podcast that uh, Anna Prepera um, and Pro Social and the Design School and also Benji Ross have just launched, which is about um, yeah interviewing people who are doing work on the ground with communities, um, with landscapes. And, um, and the first one is um, Chris Casillas, who is in uh, Superior, Arizona, who is doing amazing work to really regenerate his community. So I really recommend yeah, listening to Awakening Lands. And uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, any questions or comments? Thank you so much, Richard. That was a great talk. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I know I'm so focused sometimes on online, virtual, and crossing the country and you know connecting with people that way. But I think it's a, a really good reminder of the value of local connection. Uh, so we now have some Q&A for anyone that would like to participate. So you can raise your virtual hand. Um, if you're on Zoom on the bottom bar, there should be reactions and you can raise your hand from there. We can make a queue. Um, also feel free to use the chat if you have any thoughts or questions that you would like to put in there. Um, so any volunteers to go first? Chris? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question. It, um, I, I, love, uh, I love the things you did, which seem to be kind of startups uh kind of and i'm wondering if you've since you've tried to implement pro social in so many environments have you ever tried to take an existing organization and improve it and mm. uh, i know this is not what you were talking about but it's mm. it's something i'm very curious about yeah <clears throat> i have um yeah i have done those have tended to be maybe like one-off sessions or maybe two sessions. Um, so uh, there's a group called uh, Citizen Climate um, Lobby. You, um, yeah, looking to, you know, have a carbon carbon fee and dividends. And uh, there's a, a group in the UK uh, doing that. I, I, I did uh, have um, a kind of a relationship with them as I, I did join that group for a while and I started talking about pro-social. So they, they came to know me within that group. And then their, 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 their steering committee asked whether I would do a pro-social facilitation session for their steering committee. Um, and they found that really helpful. They were feeling very stuck and that helped them to, yeah, to get unstuck and, and to move. And also in terms of uh, of neuro rehab, um, again there again there is a relationship there. Um, a colleague who I've come to know very well through the acts community, uh, she was she asked whether I would do a pro social facilitation session for her team away day, so I did that. And uh, yeah, so so when there are existing teams for me so far, it's tended to be more a one off or a. Um, yeah, maybe it maybe a two session thing. Um, but there has been some, yeah, there has been some bit of a relationship there. Uh, I even did it for my personal trainer and his business partner as well. Um yeah, so I, I guess you know, if people are interested, I would you know, I will offer it or they might notice it and they might ask, and I'm I'm willing to give it a go. Thanks, Chris. Uh, David? Sure. Hello, and thank you very much for, for this uh, broad uh, inspirational talk. Um, my question is, is a bit technical, so um, if if you want to go very fast, uh, <laughs> feel free to do so. I I seem to notice that when you use the, the ACT matrix, uh, you cover uh, the, the, the lower right box first, then move to the um, uh, away inner box, then to the um, outer uh, away box, and eventually to the um, outer towards box, as uh, the way you labeled it is, um, how could I address uh, 
uh, I don't remember exactly, but how could how could I fix this situation? Um, which the way I, I had understood it and the way I use it, typically this is the journey from from the inner away to the outer uh, towards box um, that that comes in the end as 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 the commitment part. So um, I I don't know if could you could you sh share. The process you use going through the different quadrants, quadrants, because I find it very enriching to see how colleagues do it differently. Thank you so much. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you, and uh, yeah, great question. And with the with the app matrix, the, there's flexibility. You can start anywhere. Um, yeah, it's just um, I often find it is helpful to connect with with what matters to you, and lots of people do start that way. And I think about my clients with brain injuries who I've worked with, when they go along to an assessment, usually someone asks what their problems are and how that starts things off. Whereas if I start with, you know, what matters to you? Who matters to you? I'm building engagement and rapport straight away with someone. And then I get on to the difficult stuff. So I found that helps in my clinical work and, and generally um yeah in in meetings but you yeah you can be can be flexible um go with whatever works for that that context yeah kathleen i just want to say this was a remarkable presentation richard i'm so happy that it's going to be available as a recording for our community because it's such a a uh, a beautiful learning tool for others Regarding Gary's last question, I appreciate that you said that the act is act use of the act matrix is meant to be an evolving process. I I was privileged to see the uh, uh, Robert Stiles, a, a very accomplished act um, uh, pro social consultant, working with people who lived in Africa along the edges of a of a lake tribes. Um, who were destroying the fishing stock because they couldn't come to an agreement about how to fish together and maintain the vitality of the lake and the fishing stock within it. And he didn't use an act matrix. He sat down on the ground and he organized things in his head and he asked questions, of course, through an interpreter. And he then was able to coordinate for them a sense of what matters most without having to be rigid about going through the um, matrix. And um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, the idea is to pull out the information. My specific question is, in your second group, the um, the community sustainability group, did you actually provide them education around the pro-social toolkit? If, if you were to speak to anybody in that group, would they be able to sort of talk about how they fulfill CDP1 or CDP5, for example, or is that something that you are doing um, and bringing your own um, awareness to their work? Yeah. Um, yeah, Kathleen, yeah, um, really good point, the, the first one. And um, I'm very flexible with that as well. I, yeah, yeah, I, it's a framework, isn't it? In your head, you can see the world and then you can use your, your questions as the tool. Um, I also use pictures a lot as well with the clients I work with, someone who loves tattoos. And so, you know, their act matrix is, is full of tattoos. Um, this, this, the second, um, yeah, I'm, my, my mind hasn't kept, hasn't kept what your second part is. So if you can just, if you can just say that for me again, Kathleen. Have you have you been more formal about introducing the act, uh, the pro social toolkit to the second group, the mm -hmm. community sustainability group? Because you organize the information really well, but I'm wondering, did they mm -hmm. receive information or education about it? Do they are they thinking pro socially in that the members of that group might be able to identify? Well, this is you know we're having a conflict here and mm -hmm. uh, CDP six and we need to work on it, or is that a organizing? framework that you're bringing to your analysis of the group yes yeah um having having introduced that initially to people i think that was what what matters really resonated with people i don't think the other stuff 
really resonate, resonated so much. It's not something that people have like brought up again. Um, it's it's more the focus on carrying on doing doing the good work and um, thinking about conflict that it would you know we would probably sort it out when it happened. Um, yeah, so yeah, in in that group, it's been introduced, but it hasn't become. You know something that is a, an ongoing explicit thing it's it's something i hold in my mind um, but it's not really where the energy is for that group um, and so that's yeah that's been something that's been important for me as well uh, just because i find it helpful and important doesn't mean that um, you know that group is going to find it helpful to be explicit about it they can they can live it and I guess also for me as a as a therapist with you know with with acts um, when I'm working with people, I, I don't I may introduce the act matrix to people, but I, I I don't tell people about the the act hexaflex the funny little and say oh now we're doing diffusion or whatever it's you are you know you you are giving people experiences that highlight that to them you're modeling those processes with people so you you know you're modeling pro-social processes so people learn it through that cultural exchange but they don't all have to have that framework and um yeah i've come to know that you yeah, if people want to know the framework and are excited by that go with it but don't force don't force a framework on people um yeah Heidi. Hi, Richard. It is wonderful to hear more detail about the work that I've known you were involved in. And my question is, um, in both or either group, can you speak to a turning point, a moment when the power shifted, the hierarchy shifted from here's this idea Richard has to here's this, um, community-led um, activity. Um, and if that hasn't come yet, um, do you see what it takes to get there? I feel like there's so many of us who are the idea people. We put the ideas out there and then we lead. And then it's like, how do we do this so that it's community and not one mm -hmm. leading? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm... Uh... In 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 these examples with inspire others, um, no, I've I've seen no, Jude who is here just completely run with it. Um, yeah, Jude has been amazing on social media, uh, yeah, just just going ahead and and doing stuff, and then that hi Jude, and then that translating into into her work, um, you know, with the organisation she works with, um, within Pearly Sustainability Group. Just you know, seeing like seeing the repair cafe, I guess that was when things really took off. The energy behind that, and um, and just those relationships that keep happening. People make suggestions um, about new things they could they could do. Um, yeah, so I think that was that was you know, and that the repair cafe now is such a firmly established thing in the village. Um, yeah, so you know, if I if i'm not here I, and actually for the repair cafe i used to go along initially and then i just felt like you know a spare pair of hands um i don't have those practical skills um you know i would hang out and i would talk to people but i you know i just felt as though i wasn't needed there which was great and uh, so i don't go along to the repair cafe now they just so yeah um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and we're the half hour here. So we'll take the last question from Viveka. Hi there, Robert, uh, Richard, sorry. <laughs> Hi. I'm, uh, I'm in the kitchen cooking again. Um, but I uh, really, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Richard. It was so great to hear about your work and what you're actually doing. I, I'm in a group with you and uh, I've just heard it sort of generally referenced and so it's so great to get a get a sense of uh like more of the actual work and I'm I'm really amazed uh at what you create what you have you know, 
created and co-created and um and I think there's something about your kind of leadership style uh, and it just seemed to be so kind of communal uh like pro social seems to run in your blood somehow and um and I'm 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 kind of wondering how in addition to act and you know, pro social and all these things that you've learned and like there seem like there's something else about how you're showing up, I think, uh, in groups with with, and I felt it too. Like being being so um, like just so press. Oh, sorry. Um, there's something so present uh, and like receptive in you, uh, and I I just I kind of wonder if a little bit like where is that from, and is there any like how have we learned that, and there like we. Do you have a sense of what I was speaking about? Yeah, and I uh, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know where that where that came from. Um, I guess it, uh, yeah, I like people. Um, I'm interested in people. Um, and I guess yeah, just just having that experience where, you, like, in a session with uh, with a client you're working with, and time just disappears. Right. It is that you know that flow state where there is that yeah. connection. Um, just yeah, I guess being aware of that, mm. um, and then sort of you know act and present moment awareness and noticing if my mind's thinking about what I'm doing for dinner or um, you know or I'm you know feeling really anxious and thinking you know my my client is thinking I'm talking a load of shit um, or I and I shouldn't say this. Yeah. So that's that's added to that interest in people, uh, that ability mm -hmm. to notice what's going on inside me and um, noticing whether it's helpful to respond or not respond. Um, and yeah, and just to you know, come back to uh, to being being present, I guess, and um, just knowing that so much can come from being being present and being curious with someone and. Um, also not knowing now that's been the latest thing i guess from regeneration mm -hmm. being comfortable with with uncertainty and not knowing and um yeah i'm if you ask my wife i'm i'm not very organized outside of work i don't have a plan i don't know what's going on <laughs> with things i don't know what i'm supposed to be cooking for dinner that evening and to like rock up and um and i guess that naturally goes with i'm yeah, I'm okay now to see with what what emerges um you know where where the energy is from that person that community um yeah and just, yeah seeing seeing I guess it's that creative aspect now um, yeah yes. yeah but it and trusting it seems like you trust yeah. you show up mm. and then you trust in the process or in the emergence yeah. as you say and I guess if I think back to my my dad and my early work working in brain injury working with very complex cases mm. i guess i had that from my dad that trust that things would would work out um yeah he was you know he was a builder um you know starting starting from scratch with a house so there was that trust that things would work out and i noticed that in that early work and um yeah trusting that I, even though i didn't have a clue what i was going to do with that person um that actually yeah we would get somewhere and they would uh, would have value in their life um they would move forwards and uh, and i value you know i have that same with with communities as well um i also see the importance of, of everyone being important within the group and needing that diversity as well um, yeah so yeah great great question to get me to think about something i hadn't thought about no, it's beautiful to hear. I I mean, yeah. it's such an inspiring leadership mm -hmm. style. It's so humble and present um, and warm. So I can see why, you know, there's like, there's a lot of kind of mushrooming around you, you know, through these communities. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really inspiring, Richard. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. All right. Thank you everyone for joining and Richard, of course, for presenting. Um, Richard also shared his contact details um, so we can make sure that, that gets sent out to everyone as well in case anyone would like to follow up. Um, as usual, this seminar will be available on our YouTube page in a few days. Uh, so feel free to check that out 
uh, if you want to review any part of it or for anyone that can catch everything. All right. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you all for joining. Everybody, thank you, Richard. Yeah. Bye bye. Have a good Wonderful. Weekend. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, good to see you, Adele. <laughs>